Appreciate these young men. Appreciate the choir today. As they sang. And <clears throat> what a great job that you all did. And appreciate these young men serving the Lord at such a young age. You continue to be praying for them. I tell you, our young folks face a lot of challenges today. They face a lot of temptation. Uh, we thank the Lord for them that we've got some folk here in this church and some young folk that, that are following the example of the older folk and uh, are giving their, their life in and, and service to the Lord. And we appreciate them, appreciate everything that they do. And you pray for these uh, young mothers, these mothers of young children. They're trying to train their children, these families. And I tell you, it's, uh, it's hard sometimes. And I want you to remember to be praying for them and, and pray for your church every day. We all need it, whether you're young or whether you're uh, an older person or maybe... Where am I? I'm somewhere between them. I don't, am I old? I'm old to Tyler, but to some of you, I'm not old. Uh, but I, I don't, I'm not old, but I can see it from where I'm standing. So, probably won't be too long. But Clint's going to beat me there, no, no matter what age that is. You've got your Bible with you this morning. Would you turn and the Word of God to Colossians chapter number 1, and you pray this morning. I just feel a burden this morning. We're going to read some scripture from Colossians chapter number 1. I told you I was getting old, Jason. Last time you saw me preach, I didn't have to have these, did I? Right. <clears throat> Colossians chapter number 1. We're going to begin in verse number 19. We're going to kind of pick up in progress here, and we'll go back and mention a few verses. And I think we're going to read through verse, maybe verse 23 or something. If you'll stand to your feet as we honor the reading of God's Word together. <clears throat> the Bible says, For it pleased the Father that in Him, that is Jesus, picking up here, in Him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him, to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, and made a minister. Father, it is good to be here this morning. God, I thank You that I can stand right here. Lord, I know that it's not by my merit that I stand this morning. God, it's not by anything that I've done that, uh, Lord, did I get to be a born-again Christian this morning. But I, I'm so thankful, Lord, that no matter what may happen on this earth, that, Lord, I'm on my way to heaven. And God, there's a lot of people in this room that's born-again Christians. God, sometimes we get bogged down with the things of this world, but help us to remember this world is not our home. God, we're looking for that city, Lord, whose builder and maker is God. Help us to encourage ourselves in these facts this morning. Lord, I believe uh, that there's something going on here this morning I can't quite put my finger on. God, I know that you're doing something in our midst. And God, I, I believe that you're going to do something. Father, and it, it may be very visible to us, but even if it's not, God, we trust you to do what only you can do this morning. Father, I can't save a soul. I can't revive anybody. I can't stir anybody's heart up. But I know you can, and I know your word has the ability to do that. So, Father, I pray that you would make me obedient this morning and faithful. Father, I pray that, that somehow or another, God, that, that my mouth would, would speak the words that come directly from your heart. I prepared some things that I'm planning to say this morning, but they're of little importance, Lord, if you're not in it. So I pray for your help. God, I, I pray that you would do for these people what I can if there's even one lost person. 
God, I pray that the, the gospel would find good ground this morning and that they may come to faith in Jesus. If there's a Christian here that's struggling with something, and Lord, I know there's many that are, God, I pray that you would encourage them. God, if there's a Christian here, maybe who's grown cold in his relationship with you, Lord, maybe he's welcomed sin into his life, or, or maybe he has made up his mind that he's going to. God, I beg you this morning to say something that would draw them back to you. Help us, Lord. We need you in Jesus' name. All God's children said, Amen. 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 We may be seated. You know, I, I was thinking about the song that the boys sang this morning, and that, uh, the, the, coupled with what the choir sang was confirmation. I was struggling with this morning. Uh, Brother Tyler asked me outside. He, he said, What you going to, what, I believe he said, What you got for us this morning? I said, Brother Tyler, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to preach this morning. Uh, I've got a message, but I'm, I'm still unsure about it. And uh, maybe, maybe it got something else on my mind, but <clears throat> as, as the choir sang, uh, grace for every need, and I thought about how good that God has been to me. And then, uh, as the boys came and they sang about the cross, it was confirmed in my heart that I need to share with you uh, this morning about reconciliation. About uh, reconciliation, you you may uh, think I know that that's a, a six dollar word, and uh, I'm assuming that maybe many of you know what that means. Maybe a few of you uh, may not be exactly. Uh, Clear on that. I guess maybe a, a short definition of reconciliation would be uh, to make peace. To uh, to make peace. Maybe when we think about reconciliation, we oftentimes think about a marriage relationship. Whenever there's problems or struggles or strains on a marriage, and uh, there's a maybe a separation, we often throw that term out there. We think about reconciliation, and I believe that uh, God certainly uh, wants reconciliation. Reconciliation. In any case, where uh, there's been problems in a marriage, but this morning we're talking about reconciliation as it relates to our relationship with God. We uh, we need to be reconciled unto God because we we are separated from God. I I want to share that with you this morning. Just uh, three things very uh, quickly. We've got a baptism this morning, so uh, going to try to move quickly. If you pray a lot, I'll try to preach fast. Now, I want to share with you a little about this rec uh, this reconciliation or restoration of our relationship with God. Look with me back in verse number 21. I'm going to try to uh, share with you why we need to be uh, uh, reconciled through uh, verse 21. It says here, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So uh, who who is uh, I, and I kind of made this point the uh, the 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 creature of reconciliation. Who who needs reconciliation? Who who is it that needs to make peace? With God, that verse tells us that uh, very clearly. Look again with me there in verse number uh, twenty-one. It says, uh, "It says there, and you, and you, me, and you are the ones that need to be reconciled under God." You, it says, you talking about you and me. Now uh, that's who he's talking to. Uh, so, so you see, those that are alienated, and he mentions two things right there who are alienated uh, from God. Now, verse number 21 said, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind and by wicked works. So, in your mind by wicked works. In your mind by wicked works. That's what that says, ain't it? No, really, is that what it says? Yeah. It says, in your mind, by wicked work. So, uh, so we think about how that we're alienated from God. Now, the creatures of alienation, those are, that are alienated by their deeds. Now, 1 Corinthians 6 says in verse 9 and 10, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit 
the kingdom of God. So those that are alienated by their deeds are all these people that the apostle mentions over in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Uh, so, so he's dealing with people who are what? Sinners. That's who he's dealing with. So uh, in, in short, he's dealing with every one of us. We, we've all sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, he names some sin there. Now I want you to think about this. Even if you're not guilty of any of those sins that he named in 1 Corinthians 6, which I doubt, probably every one of us guilty of one of those at least, if not several of those that have been mentioned, but even if we're not guilty of any of those, the Bible says we have a problem called inherited sin. Did you know that? Original sin. Many people uh, call it that, and you've heard it termed that, and it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter number 3. Now, the Bible says after Adam sinned, that he passed that along unto you and, you and I. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, wherefore as by one man, talking about Adam, one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, the Bible goes further to say in the book of Psalms 51, 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my my mother conceived me. Romans 3, 10, uh, 10 through 13 uh, says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That flies in the face of what is generally accepted today. You see, we live in a time where people say, it don't really matter what you believe as as long as you're sincere. But the Bible says that you're a sinner and you're bound for hell unless you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible's pretty clear on that. You see, there's a problem with inherited sin. Now, unless we get unless we get too hard, unless we go too hard on Adam and we, we blame Adam and Eve, we look back at the garden and say, man, it was Adam that got me into all this mess. If it wasn't for Adam and Eve, I wouldn't be where I am today. You, you know, every one of us have chosen to sin. There's not a soul in this room that's never willfully chosen to sin. Every one of us. Who, who, who's never done something that they knew was wrong and they knew it from start to finish, but they went on and did it anyway? I tell you, the biggest problem I got is not the devil. He looks at me in the face every morning and he gets uglier every day. He looks at me in the face every day. It's me. I'm the biggest problem that I have. Sometimes I choose to sin. You, you remember that list back there? He, he, he talks about sexual sin. Certainly we live in a, in a sexualized environment. We live in a time where uh, adultery uh, is, is rampant. We live in a time where fornication, and, and fornication could apply to all kind of things, any kind of uh, sexual immorality outside of the marriage relationship. Uh, maybe uh, it, it could apply to pornography, all kind of things. Uh, like that, but it's basically gross sexual immorality, fornication, adulterers, uh, homosexual activity, all those things are very prevalent in the society that we live in today, and it's really not very popular to speak against that. You know, people want to say, well, that's the way that I was made. Well, that's just the way that I am, but that's not true. God doesn't sin, God's never sin, and God will not, cannot, in fact, tempt you to sin. Now, there are are some areas where all of us have some temptations. We may have a weakness and it's unfair for me to blame God for my weakness, to blame God for my inability uh, to control myself because the problem is me. If I would get my body under subjection, if I would resist the devil, submit to God, the Bible says that he'd flee from me. You see, the devil can't make me do anything. There, he talks about False. He talks about sexual sins. We're, you know, as Baptists, we're good at talking about that. And I'm not saying sexual sin is not a problem. Certainly it runs rampant. But there are other things on the list there. Uh, you may not be guilty of one of those, but 
He also talked about idolaters. Now, when he wrote this to uh, to the church there, uh, we understand that there, there there were people that had had in their background false uh, or, or worshiping false gods. He he's speaking to the Gentiles now in in First Corinthians twelve two. It says, "Know ye that ye were Gentiles? Know ye that where you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb items, idols, even as ye were led." So many of these Gentiles worship false gods. And it was very prevalent. They would worship God's many. God's in the plural form. Now, not many of us, it, I guess that we could say has that problem today. It's probably not a soul in here that's ever bowed down to an image that has ever bowed down to a, a, a wooden uh, 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 carved god or a, a one out of stone or one out of silver or, or, or a picture or anything like that. But, you know, idolatry has got a pretty expansive definition. Not only uh, does it mean something like that, but it could also mean anything that you put ahead of God comes, becomes your God. And now, as we think about it in that, uh, in, in that context, have you ever allowed something to become more important to you in life than your relationship with God? Because it could be lots of things. It could be a relationship with a person. It could, be, uh, it, it could be a child or a spouse. Listen, anything. I believe that Abraham, if you, if you look back in Genesis, I believe that he had a problem uh, with his son, Isaac. In, in, in fact, I, I think that he waited on Isaac so long, he probably set Isaac up, and the Lord asked him to sacrifice Isaac. And I believe that he did that to kind of teach him that he had set Isaac up, and Isaac had become more important to him than God himself. You, you see, many times we allow that. It could be money. It could be a job. It could be a relationship with anybody. It could even be church work. It might even be being a pastor, Brother Tyler. That's anything that becomes more important to you than God has become your God. And you are guilty of idolatry. Now, uh, not only that, but he also talked about thieves. Though, uh, not only that, but uh, the, the covetous, you, you, you know, that's an evil desire. You know, maybe not many people understand what covetousness is, but that, uh, that's lusting after something that God has not given you. It's in a sense saying God didn't, didn't give me what I need to lust. You see, God gives you everything that you need. The Bible says He gives you everything that pertaineth to life and godliness. Did you know that? And if He didn't give it to me, I ought not seek after it. I ought not try and get it. In fact, that's what covetousness means. It's, it means you're, you're seeking after it. You're, you're striving for something that is not yours. Now, Exodus says, do not covet. We, we shouldn't covet another man's, uh, the Bible says another man's wife or another man's household. Anything that somebody else has, we shouldn't have an evil desire to go out and get that. To go out and make it ours. He, he talked about drunkards. Many people's had problems with that. You see, nothing else should control you. Uh, Ephesians tells us that. Uh, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You see, he also talks about a reviler. He said some of them were revilers. What does that mean? Well, it means a coarse, a hard, or a bitter man often runs other people down. Has harsh words to say to other people. He says, of such were some of you. And some of us may have problems with that. You, you see, the creature of reconciliation are these people. These people that are alienated by their deeds and also by their thoughts. In other words, it's you and it's me. Romans 8, 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity, that means it wars, it, it's enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God and neither indeed can be. You see, uh, refusing to acknowledge the truth. There are many today that have refused to acknowledge the truth of the Word of God. That would describe a lot of folks today. You, you see, verse number 21, again there, he says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Aren't you glad he's reconciled us? You know, we were once sinners. 
We were once sinners. We were guilty of all this gross immorality. But uh, you, you, you see, God reconciles now. We'll pick up steam. You see the creature of reconciliation. Not only that, verse number two, uh, 22 talks about the cause of reconciliation. What did it cost to make this right? What does it cost to be reconciled to God? Verse 22, read it with me. It says, In the body of His flesh through death. In the body of His flesh through death. That, that's how you and I are reconciled. You see, the cause was set by God. The Bible says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The shedding of blood goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned there, the Bible says that God came out to walk with them in the cool of the garden. And the Bible says, And when they heard God's voice, they, they knew that they were naked. They knew they were aware of their sin and they tried to cover it. They, they took fig leaves and sewed them together and, and made them aprons or made them coverings. And they, I can imagine them looking at each other going, you know, you look pretty good. I can't even tell. You've, you've covered that sin up. But God said that wasn't good enough. You see, God could see through that. And the blood of an animal, God took coats and made from the, the, the skin of an animal and covered them. The first blood was shed there in the garden. You, you find that throughout uh, the, the, the Jewish practice. They, uh, they killed uh, uh, bulls and, and goats and, and all these things for sacrifices over and over and over until Jesus came and then He was the final sacrifice. He died on Calvary's cross and He shed His blood and His blood cleanses us from all iniquity. That's how we get reconciliation. You see, salvation may be free, but it ain't cheap. You see, the price was set by God, but the price was also settled by God. You see, He set a price we could not never pay. I couldn't pay it. You couldn't pay it. Why couldn't I pay it? Because I'm not innocent. Because I'm a sinner. I'm not able to cover that cost. But God did what only God could do. God set the price and God settled the price in the form of His Son Jesus on Calvary's cross. And that's the way that we are, that's the way that you and I are reconciled. It cost God His very best. It cost God His Son. And you see, not only the cost and the creature of reconciliation, but also the caution to the reconciled. What do you mean, preacher? Well, Look at verse number 23. You know, if you've been bought back, the Bible says you've been purchased at a price. You're a slave to Christ. You've been reconciled. You've been made back right with God. Read verse 23. Put it in context. Read 22. In the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. And He says, if you continue... In the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard. Now, on the surface, you say, preacher, that looks like you can lose your salvation. Listen, I'm going to assure you that you cannot lose your salvation. By very definition, eternal life lasts forever. No one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. That if there is kind of for the, I guess for the sake of, of argument, but it says, if you continue, what it could have said was, when you continue in the faith. Or it could say, you will continue in the faith. You see, if you are born again, if you're reconciled to God, God presents you, Christ presents you holy, unblameable, unreprovable, when you continue, you will continue in the faith. Grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. What's that mean, preacher? Well, to remain steadfast in your beliefs. You see, there were a lot of preachers, there were a lot of false teachers at that time that had come along and added things to the gospel. It said not only do you need the blood of Jesus, but the blood of Jesus is not enough. You, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. You, you've got to be circumcised. You, you've got to be baptized. You've got to uh, be a, a, a member here or a member there. It's all about what you do. And all false religion is about do, do, do. All 
what Christianity is about done. Jesus did it on the cross. It's, it's, it's about being done. You see, he set the price. Remember that? What else did he do? He settled it. He settled the price. He paid my debt. I'm not working to pay my debt. I'm, I'm working because my debt's been paid. That's what we're doing today. I'm not working at all. If I'm working because my debt's been settled and I now belong to Him. Don't be seduced by false teachers. Adding to the gospel. You see, re remain steadfast in your beliefs. Don't move away from the gospel. We're, we're going to baptize a young man here in a little bit. Many, many people attach salvation to baptism. And I, I, I believe that once a man asks the Lord Jesus Christ to come in his heart and he, uh, he confesses his sin, places his faith and trust in Christ, leaves his sin behind, he's as saved right then as he's ever going to be. Why do we baptize people, preacher? The Bible says to us. Jesus says baptize them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we're following the Lord. You ought to be baptized. If you're a saved individual, never made a public profession of faith, you ought to be baptized. You ought to say, hey, I believe in Jesus. What does baptism do? Well, it, it identifies you as a Christian. That's the way the early church did it. When you were baptized, it means you, when you go in the water, just like Jesus went in the dead, or went in the grave, you go in as a dead man, and then as, as Jesus came out of the grave, you're pulled up out of the water, signifying that you're a new creature in Christ. That the old is behind, and the new is before you. You see, that's what Jesus did. You're, you're identifying with Him. You see, there's a caution here. Remain steadfast in your beliefs. Don't be uh, seduced. Don't be seduced. Not only that, but remain steadfast in your behavior. Skip down to verse number 28. Paul said, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. He said we preach and we teach warning every man basically so that we can present him complete. So that we can present him mature. Be careful of your behavior. You see, you're cautioned about your behavior as a Christian. One day, you're going to be accountable to the Lord. If you're a member of this church, let me just share this with you. You're accountable to this church right now for the way that you live your life. The things that you do, the things that you say, you're accountable to this body. And one thing I want you to remember, if you don't take anything else, is every sin has a consequence. And it's not just your consequence. Others will suffer because you choose to sin. It's always innocent people that get wrapped up in sin. You don't believe me? Go back in the book of Joshua and read about Achan. I was struggling with that this morning. I almost went there and preached that. Uh, the Bible says that Achan, Achan took of the accursed thing. He had been warned not to do something. But he made up his mind that he wanted that wicked thing more than he loved his God. And the Bible says he suffered for that. In fact, the Bible says he was struck down dead for that. And it's a serious thing to accept sin knowingly in your life. I tell you, God may take your life. I, I don't know what He'll do. His family even died as a result of His sin. His family. You old David, you know, I think of all what it cost him to sin. And if he'd have known he, what the cost was, if he'd have counted the cost, he never would have done it. But I believe people get one thing on their mind. And they've got an idea that that's the one thing they want. And everything else is left behind. If you're thinking about doing that one thing, you've got to know it comes at a cost. It comes at a price. You'll cost, you'll hinder your prayers, those that you've been praying for to be saved. If your prayers are hindered, how are they going to get right with God? You've been praying for so-and-so, your neighbor to get saved, and you're living like hell all week. First of all, you're not setting a good example for them. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. And God's probably not going to hear your prayer if you've accepted sin in your life. 
there's a caution. Our sin will have un, unintended consequences. You see, Jesus paid the price. There was a cost of reconciliation. <clears throat> you and I, he says there in verse number 21, we're the benefit, we're the creature. And you that were sometimes alienated by enemies in your mind. I, I thought about that. Will, you boys come back up here and get those instruments and let me get you to play again. I, I was thinking about that song. And what this scripture says, you who were sometimes, one time. There was a time in my life and I didn't know Jesus. And I was happy living in my sin. And I thought that I was all right. I don't know why God saved me. AJ, I have no idea. There are other people I would judge to be more deserving than me of, of God's grace. But that's just it. God's grace he is undeserved. I didn't deserve it. You don't deserve it. But He's given you a chance today. He's paid the price. He's, he, he, he settled the cost. He said it, he, and He settled it on Calvary's cross. For me to go on in sin, I, that would be like kicking dirt upon the blood of Jesus. Trodden underfoot the precious blood of Jesus. Spitting on the blood of Jesus.